ConocoPhillips hosted its annual analyst and investment meeting in November and unveiled a 10-year plan for the company. That plan includes a free cash flow projection of $50 billion and a planned $30 billion of stock buybacks just over the next decade. Since that announcement, the stock is up a little under 4%, but in the week after it, it was up by about 7 or 8%. Joining us right now with more on his plan for the company and much more is Ryan Lance. He is ConocoPhillips chairman and CEO. And Ryan, it's great to see you. Thank you, Becky. Nice to be here. Thanks Appreciate for coming it. in. Thank you. Uh, I, I think what investors liked about what they heard, not a, not a huge amount of surprises, but the idea that you are keeping capital expenditures kind of under control, under $7 billion, but at the same time, you do expect to see your output increase by about 3% a year. Correct. How do you do that? How do you get more with less? Well, I think it, it, it's a part of the portfolio. It's getting a low-cost supply portfolio, trying to generate free cash. We've just decided to embrace the volatility that's naturally in the market in the oil price today. So we need to run at a good price. We need to run at a low break-even, have low-cost supply resources. We can grow the company at $7 billion, as you described. We can generate free cash um, below $40 a barrel. And we think that's the key to success. Have a very strong balance sheet to be able to run consistently through these volatile markets. And, uh, and just let our teams be efficient and generate as much output as they can given the capital that we've and the scope that we've set for the, for the team. That's a great plan to make sure you're not watching too much volatility, but I have to guess you're still kind of watching oil prices, mm -hmm. gas prices, what they're doing on a pretty regular basis. Well, yeah, obviously, obviously we watch it, but we just try to take it out of how we think about the company. So I tell them, it, it, you know, run this program at 40. I don't care if it's 40. I don't care if it's 80. Just go execute this program, grow the company and do it as cheaply and as efficiently as we can. And, ta and take the volatility out of it. We know it's going to stand. We know it's going to be here for a long period of time. And, but we have to have a financial framework and a concept for running the company that takes that volatility out. Run at the downside and give investors full upside as, as prices go up. And that's what additional, we're offering. Additional difference Absolutely. in buybacks. So our cash flow will grow dr dramatically at 60, 65, and 70. The problem is if we see 70, we're going to see $40, $40 right. again. Right. And yeah. that's the volatility you have to embrace. In this see, business. With, with that strong balance sheet, you, you're, you're going to see opportunities for consolidation in energy. We had the Oxy Anadarko deal. I'm not right. sure what you think of that deal. Uh, but w would you be looking for opportunities as we see consolidation? Well, I think what we tried to lay out a plan is we don't, we don't need to go after any of those opportunities. We're having a hole in our portfolio. We've got a very strong plan over the course of next years. But we've worked really hard to get the balance sheet in the shape that we have. And some consolidation has to happen in this business. We've been in this game. You know, for the last number of years, we've been acquiring assets. We've been looking for distressed players in this in this business. But really, what we have in the portfolio and a plan is we don't need to go do any of that. But we're not blind to what's going on. Yeah, in the I, I share now. the laugh on Oxy and Anadarko. <laughs> you know, say no more. And to your point, Ken, no, we don't hedge. You don't so hedge. we complete. We give investors complete what upside what to that have. commodity price. Good. Yeah. yeah, and we get a break, a low break even. So we get downside protection to our investors and full upside participation. Do, do you go in and rework your wells? Like absolutely. As they get lower, as, as they productivity. Yeah, you know, absolutely. We're, we're applying technology to increase recovery mm -hmm. out of existing wells. The cheapest, highest returning stuff we can go do is already put the capital in the ground, right. get more recovery out of those wells, out of those Water fields. injection. Absolutely. We do, we do all of that. Okay. You also have to deal with geopolitical volatility. I, I don't know how you sleep at night. <laughs> what, what, tell us what's going on in Venezuela. What's, what's the latest there? Well, it's a pretty tough situation right now in Venezuela. We're working closely. We had a judgment a, against the Venezuelans for $8 billion. Mm -hmm. So we're in the process of trying to recover that. To date, we've recovered just short of $800 million through the judgment and through the payment that they're paying us quarterly. So, but it's a tough situation in country. We have a number of Venezuelan employees that still work for our company. We have families sitting in the country, and the situation is pretty difficult. Now, so. they're on your payroll, so they're getting paid, thank God. Correct. How are they impacted in terms of the money they have and not being able to buy basics like foods? Well, it, it is, it's very difficult. A lot of our employees are shipping materials back into country, and, and surprisingly, they are getting into country. So medical supplies, food, and staples. So those people who can afford to pay for it. Yeah, people who can, af can afford to pay for it. But well, I, people, I, I are, wish, people are evacuating to Columbia. People are leaving the country. I wish grow. Bernie and uh, Bernie Sanders, not Bernie Marcus, Bernie Sanders and uh, Elizabeth Warren and that whole gang, give them a charter flight to Venezuela and say, here, here's what you get when the government does everything for you. What, 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 does this Saudi IPO, with t I think today's D-Day for getting, getting their bids, it may be tomorrow, but I think it's today right about now, uh, does this impact your business? You know, we were, you know, we were concerned about two things. One, is it going to draw investors away because they're going to offer a value proposition that's quite compelling? Well, listing on the Saudi market for 1.5% yeah. is not going to draw investors mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, when you read their filings, 
to cover their dividend in their capital program takes 55 to 60 dollars. So, you know, that's not going to be competitive. You know, I'm not worried about that. For for me, that's in the low 40s. So, you know, they don't offer really a competitive sort of situation for me. I think what's going to be interesting is the impact it has on government policy now as Aramco goes goes public and the intera interaction between that because it's and clear OPEC. And, and OPEC, OPEC more because it's clear they have to uh, they need a certain price and market share mm -hmm. is no longer an issue for them. Right. So I think it does have implications longer term on sort of how we think about the market and think about the commodity price and what it, what it's going to take to stabilize that. But there's really no incentive to be messing around with pricing because if you cut, they're going to cut. Absolutely. So you're all getting the same physical share, but you're making less dollars. Yeah. All of you. Yeah. No, I think it's been clear all along that a, you know, the, an increase in the price is better off for, for, for OPEC and for the countries to fund the budget. Mm -hmm. And still to balance the budget in Saudi Arabia level takes even a higher price than right. 55 or 60. And you and I were talking off air that the Saudi Aramco IPO is structured in a bit of a heads I win, tails you lose. You know, they, when the price goes up, they get if to you, collect you're, more. You're talking about from the company's perspective. From the company's from perspective, the pardon me. Right, when yeah. the price of oil goes up, they get to collect a higher percentage. No, they cream the upside. So right. they're, they're taking a disproportionate share of the upside given the filings that they've mm -hmm. described and the dividends that they're going to give back to the investors. It's going to be limited and capped. As if if oil prices were, were to rise. Ryan, what do you think about the, the economy? Because we've had this raging debate about whether things are improving, <laughs> whether we've skipped the recession or whether that's just around the corner. You've got to look globally uh, to see what's going to happen to the price of oil. Yeah, you know, we, we see slowdown. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely slowing down, but it, it looks like to us it's kind of bottom, bottoming a bit. We see demand fairly healthy next year on the oil side, about you know, a million barrels a day in growth in oil demand. Uh, the balance, the market's thinly balanced in a 50 to 60 dollar kind of world. As long as OPEC keeps, uh, you know, one 1.5 million barrels a day off the market like they've been doing, the U.S. is going to grow again next year. We will produce probably close to a million or more barrels of liquids per day again next wow. year of incremental growth. Wow. So the the unconventionals and what the U.S. is doing has been remarkable. That's going to continue. Now productivity is slowing a little bit. So you might say that it's turning over just a little bit as the access to capital for some of the smaller ENP is reduced. The banks are, are not loaning. The IPO markets aren't available to these companies. So we see some you know, lessening of, of, of that impact. But there's going to be growth out of the U.S. and it's probably going to consume all of the demand growth, which is going to keep a knock on price as long as OPEC keeps doing So prices right. at the pump ought to be fairly stable. Right? Yes. I don't that's think important you. for the consumer. By the way, and that's we're getting a dividend from that right now in the economy because they're paying less. On, on Plus, they're buying cars that are more efficient, so they're getting it two ways. They're they're getting better utilization of the gas they're buying at a stable yeah, price. And you you have a lower cost on the industrial side because of natural gas pricing. Talk real quick about what you're thinking with natural gas. Yeah, natural gas in the U.S. We're blessed with a hundred year supply. <laughs> it's going to be for a long period of time. So manufacturing is is benefiting from that uh, uh, cost of the gas and. And as we look at that, there's going to be plenty of natural gas even around the globe and around the world, which helps in the, in the transition, helps in the climate debate, and, uh, and, and is really going to help manufacturing here in the U.S. That's why some of that manufacturing has come back to the U.S. over the last decade. We represent some of the lowest cost gas in the, in the entire world today. You, you have a huge intellectual property portfolio. I'm, <laughs> I'm curious if you have a view on the China trade war from the perspective of going after IP <laughs> theft. Well, we're one of the two cases in front of the WTO on that very <laughs> so you might have a right view. now. So, uh, yeah, it's a it's a problem, and certainly uh, I think and I think the Chinese recognize that it's a problem, and certainly something that needs to needs to be fixed and needs to be addressed going forward if they're going to achieve the ambitions that they have as a country. As well. they're going they to have to recognize they suddenly that. have IP too. Yeah, my, my, Pardon me. Uh, they suddenly have IP too. That yeah, they, they like do. Protect. That they that they're going to need to protect. Yeah. My problem with IP with the Chinese is they'll acknowledge it. But you have no way to prosecute it. This is part of the problem that Lighthouse is having. That if you have a valid claim, where do I go prosecute it? And the Chinese say, that's internal. You can't tell us what to do. Well, that puts no teeth. Right. So they have to address those of issues. Of course. So that's, I mean, that's, that's part of what Lighthouse what makes is the China, holding out for. That's what makes this uh, agreement between our two exactly. countries difficult. Well, it sounds like you, you think something had to be done. Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, you've got to draw the line somewhere at some point in time and say, you know, the, the not, enough's enough, yep. yeah. and we, we have to do something about this. Now, right. the degree to which you do that and how far it has to go, I leave that to the experts, but it's, it's, it's time to make some You know, in times past, 
the way you settle your difference is wars. So we're making a hell of a lot of improvement here. We're still at the table talking to each other, no saber rattling, none of that. Yeah. You're right. We, 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 we have, we've reached a point, an inflection point, where we have to say to the Chinese, enough. You want to be a big boy, you want to sit at the table with us, you got to live by the same laws we live. Yeah, I think if you want to be a global player, there's exactly. global, global rules. Exactly. That are required.